All right, all right. Hey guys, welcome to the next episode. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just say, uh, you know, we don't run ads, so you know, we only have one fee, and that's if you uh, learn something or you enjoy the show, please share the show, leave us a rating on whatever platform you're listening to: iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google, Amazon, Audible, or Spotify. So let's dig in. Uh, today's guest is Jawad Deshadi. Dashti. Dashti. Uh, hey, he's still butchered it. I still butchered right. it. I you're, not, you're not the first. You won't be the last. <laughs> I even tried. So, And, of course, my lovely wife, Misty, is with us today. So, um, man, let's jump in. So you and I were talking ahead of time. We are talking a little bit and uh, just kind of start out. So Jawad runs a – he does run a Facebook group uh, here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And then, of course, he um, is a very experienced real estate investor. I'm going to let you take over. So kind of give me an idea of how you got started and give us your background. Um, yeah, uh, for a lot of people out here locally know that started off with a plumbing company. So I had some construction experience. I was always working for, um, people in real estate that were bragging about how much money they made. So I wanted to get it a, a try. Um, <clears throat> I bought my first flip in 2010 and I begged like everybody I knew to like do this with me and everybody was all about talking about it, but nobody would do it with me. <laughs> They think um, you're. They think you're crazy. Uh, no, they all wanted to do it, but like you know, the risks. Like people weren't going to take it. Which yeah. a lot of those people have approached me since then. And, <laughs> okay, you still want a partner? <laughs> I'm back. <clears throat> but in 2010, I started my first flip. I really didn't have much money. Hmm. I lived in the flip. I would go to work. Uh, I'd get my paycheck of six hundred dollars a week. I'd take a hundred bucks of it. You know, buy a faucet, put it in, go to work, you know, make some money, go buy two boxes of tile and only install that much and just hope to God they didn't discontinue the tile before I finished tile oh, the house. No. Oh, that would be horrible. Um, <laughs> in 2013, at, at the same time, I was starting my own business, so I wasn't focusing too much on the real estate. Uh, 2013, I bought my first uh, rental property and did that Section 8 which like I only knew of this stuff. I really didn't know what I was doing. And um, honestly, I probably should have done more research on it all. But did you, did you acquire those tenants or were they already, or, or did you have to, or after, did you buy the property and then? No, I found the property on Craigslist and this guy was like, hey, my parents died. I'm selling the place. You can have everything in it. I just want the motorcycle. And when that guy didn't want anything, he meant it. And I was like, you don't want, like, these pictures of your parents? He's like, no, nah, you can keep them. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> Decoration. Yeah. And I ran my real estate business very differently then. Like, I did everything myself. And uh, I went out there and pushed all the furniture outside. Because, you know, these were, like, old people's furniture. So I wasn't going to try to keep it and furnish the place or anything put signs out there that stuff's for sale, that it was too cheap to pay for a dumpster, that's too cheap to pay for contractors. As people were, like, buying the couches or lamps or whatever, I was taking that money and putting it in the property. And um, I did really well. I bought a house in Mesquite, which now these days they go for 250000 I bought it for $39,000 and uh, leased it out for twelve eighty through Section 8. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's a good return. Yeah, I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. Like, <laughs> I was like, okay, so I guess what I'm going to try to do is get my money back in like three years. And uh, I didn't realize I was doing pretty well on that. Um, for my second property, it was a short sell because I realized I wasn't just going to keep finding properties on Craigslist. Yeah. <laughs> um, short sell went okay, but it didn't go like how they promised. Um, you know, they had pictures of how it looked and a $5,000 guarantee. That's how it's going to look. It didn't look that way at all. The tenant had trashed the property moving out. They wouldn't give me the $5,000. Um, but you know, that worked out as well. Um, third property. I didn't know what driving for dollars was. I didn't know what a bando was, but I was like, I gotta get another property like this and started like walking around, like putting notes on houses didn't even know what skip tracing was. So, like, I found an abandoned house, and I Googled it. Luckily, it was an LLC that owned it, so it popped up on Google. And uh, bought me a four-bedroom house in Bolt Springs for 50000 And I remember, like, the only thing that was really wrong with it was, like, there was a hole in the ceiling where a roof leak had 
put a hole in the ceiling and everybody that was my friends like came and looked at it and they're like, you should not buy this house. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw dollar signs. You're like, yes, that's going to be. Yeah. And it was funny how intimidating that was. And now like we'll buy houses that are literally like falling over. And we're like, yeah, eh, that's nothing. This will be smooth. It's bricks and sticks. You can fix it. Yeah. That's crazy. So you're, so you just, you didn't, you just kind of started out on a whim and, and worked your way in and, and then just from one house to the next. And, and then what point did you, what point did you really start scaling up and kind of like, I guess, cause it sounds like you kind of started out small, like a lot of people do. And then you start to scale. Where'd you go? You know what? I'm going to start scaling or, you know, cause you mentioned you were doing a lot of the work yourself originally. Would yeah. You? I was doing it all myself and, uh, which was a good pace because I was just starting my own business. So I was kind of like trying to do real estate on the side and I could only find a good real estate deal, maybe like one every couple of months. So I had a couple of months to work on it and get it leased out mm -hmm. and it was kind of working very timely. Um, but after my fourth house, prices started to like skyrocket in like maybe 2014, 2015. And I don't know if that was like the market coming back after 2008 or what, but I was like, okay, well, I was just getting houses for thirty, forty thousand dollars and now like instantly they're a hundred grand. Yeah. And I'm like, this isn't giving me the return that I want. And um uh, it's really sad to say now that I know a lot more about real estate, like I turned down so many houses that were thirty grand. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, I should have just bought them all. <laughs> um Isn't that nuts? You look at it and you're like you, you probably drive by and you're like, Oh my god had that one it wasn't mine <laughs> i didn't know how how well i was doing and that's the sad thing about being uneducated was i didn't know i was doing great um but it all started taking off and i was like okay well like how or where can i still get these kind of returns mm -hmm. and i started looking around and craigslist again for the win <laughs> i see a wholesaler but i didn't know what a wholesaler was even when i bought it i didn't know it took me years later to realize it was a wholesaler but they had a condo over off like the Skillman Aldelia area yep. for it was a two bedroom for five thousand dollars. And I pulled up the rental comps and I'm like, I could rent this thing for nine eighty a month. And so I went out there, bought it, <clears throat> and uh really just lipsticked it. I probably put like two grand into it and I rented it out immediately. And I was like that's really good returns. Like the HOA fees were only $140 a month. And if you know that area, like the HOA doesn't do anything. It's not like they're yeah. strict. <laughs> it wasn't a great area. Um, so within the next two years, I bought probably 13 condos in the area, all in different complexes. And uh, I was making a lot of cash flow. I was doing really good on that. And then like all of a sudden, <laughs> All of a sudden, these condos went from being like five, ten grand a piece to like seventy. Oh, and oh wow! Your, yeah. equity, your equity just went way up. Yeah, my equity went up, but I'd <laughs> rather not have the equity and keep buying the cash flow. Yeah. <clears throat> so I was like, okay, well, once again, I'll just figure it out. Like, what else could I do? And so you were fight. You you were you were investing initially, investing for cash flow. Like that was your yeah. main thing. Yeah. Equity wasn't so even. So I wasn't thought. using debt. Um, I just started my own plumbing company. And so like, I would go do somebody's sewer line for five grand and then I'd be like, all right, like, let me add this to some money and buy this condo or whatever. And so I didn't know about debt yet either. Yeah. Um, so I'm really just kind of like tiptoeing into it all. And, um, but yeah, cash flow was like the whole main thing. And so after that, I was like, okay, how am I going to make this money? And in 2015, like now apartments is the hottest, coolest thing you could do. In <laughs> right. 2015 and before that, if you owned apartments, you were a slumlord. Like it was frowned <laughs> upon. Other investors like just didn't think highly of you. And it was not the cool thing to do. Um, but I guess at some point all the syndications were having the same issues as me and weren't seeing the returns on houses and everything anymore and decided to go to them. But, um, I bought a 20 unit apartment complex over by the Cowboy stadium. And I think 
probably like 18,000 a door. It was pretty cheap. Is that when you started getting into debt or did you kind of, were I, you selling things off? Then? Uh, I sold four houses, didn't use 1031 exchanges cause I didn't know what that was. So I took a big tax hit, <laughs> but I sold four houses to buy these apartments and I was still just charting out cash flow. Like, man, like how much more cash flow I can make. And on the apartments, I started working on them by myself. And at first, I thought they were going to be, like, mostly lipstick. But when I really started going through them, I was like, man, I should really, like, do more to them. And the occupancy was, like, terrible. So I moved people from one building all to another one. Like, I just did, like, the absolute minimum to make the other building livable. Moved everybody over and started remodeling the empty building. And that's when I was like, this is going to cost me more in loss of rents trying to do this myself. So that's when I started trying to like build a team, which was a very long, hard and expensive process. process. Yeah. So that, that was about the time you started to scale. Yeah. Was when you sold, you sold four houses and then you said, Hey, I'm going to buy an apartment complex. And you say you didn't tend to did not tend 31 exchange no. that. And so, and then you started to build a team, which obviously you're a plumber, so you don't have to worry about if they're a bad plumber. You can yeah. pretty much pick that up right out the gate. Like, oh, he's a horrible plumber. So that was, you said it was pretty expensive after a while. Like it started, or, or it was expensive. That, uh, would consider that your education <laughs> that you I, didn't mean to pay I, for? I have <laughs> considered this entire process yeah. <laughs> to this day still an education, but yes, absolutely. Awesome. So when, so how much, I guess at what point did things start to flip from plumbing into more full-time real estate? Um, somewhere in the condos, I went full-time. Um, my plumbing company was doing pretty good after a couple of years where I had a manager that would run everything. And one year I went to Vegas for like two weeks and you know, the world didn't end. So I was like, <laughs> yeah. all right, this is going to work out. So I was like, Hey, guess what? Um, you're promoted and I do real estate now. Call me if you need anything. And, um, you know, I was getting a lot of phone calls and stuff, but it, it worked out. Yeah. Um, what do you think you did different? So like, I, you know, you, you meet individuals, um, you know, it, just listening to your story, like there's people who start and they just never really get past a certain point for scale like what do you think that you did different that even without the education because it's not you know i mean just hearing your story you know you didn't show up at a real estate club and go learn or anything you're just you're learning on the fly what do you think made it different for you to be able to take those next leaps into the next you know the next class or asset not to try to sound like inspirational or anything <laughs> but my entire life i've had to do things on survival mode mm -hmm. and that's something that i'm just now literally just now not feeling like i have to do that anymore um you know we were raised extremely poor and if we wanted something we had to figure out how to go get it ourselves and <clears throat> i didn't appreciate education i do now like now every second like that I'm not doing something, I'm on my phone reading something, watching mm -hmm. a podcast, YouTube videos, whatever. Um, I'm addicted to absorbing information now. Um, but I, like, failure was an option. If it didn't work out, I didn't fail. I just needed to change it and change it and change it and change it until it worked. So do you think that, that makes sense. I mean, so you didn't start really... I mean, you got firsthand education, but you didn't start really kind of soaking things in until later on yeah. and looking and seeking it out, I guess I'd say. So, um, what's your, which one, what's some of your favorite things to invest into? I know we talked about multifamily and you mentioned, you know, single family. I know you mentioned commercial when we were talking a minute ago, you know, what is the one thing that you like the most? If you're like, Hey, I've got to spend my time investing into that. Um, nothing will ever be as good as a three bedroom, two bath house. <laughs> But we're back to that time where, like, you can't get a good deal on them. And yeah. if you do, you're buying it at 1% rents, and you're having to do, like, a $50,000 remodel to get it there. Um, back in the day, that didn't used to be true. So 
that will always be the favorite because it's easiest to lease, easiest to sell with your ex exit strategy, great cash flow, easy to do loans. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, I'm kind of focusing away from that because I, I really always try to do the opposite of everybody else. You know, no matter what everybody else is doing, if everybody's buying, I'm typically selling. If everybody's selling, that's when I typically try to buy. Um, but apartments. I think are not something that I want to hold um, because the management, like I said, is a lot of stress and nightmare. And people are like, hire our management company. Well, unless they're over 75 to a hundred doors, you're not going to get anybody good. Like I don't, yeah. I don't care what people say. I, I've tried multiple management companies. I've seen people hire hundreds of management companies. I know people that own management companies. They're not good. Um, like there's definitely some that are better than the others, but you know, my occupancy, I went from being a hundred percent occupied on my apartments whenever I hired one all the way down to 50% in a few months. And <coughs> you take that plus their fees. Yeah. And like, I mean, they were really just eating me alive and you know, everybody was like fire this company. And I'm like, look, they just got hard on. Let me let them, you know, get it together, you know, maybe they're just trying to figure it out. You know, six months goes by, occupancy is even worse. I call them, they're like, well. <coughs> You're good, man. Hey, we, we like to keep it live here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I talked to everybody and they're like, um, at the property management company, they're like, hey, you just didn't buy good apartments. Like they're in a bad place. I'm like, what do you mean a bad place? Like they're by the Cowboy Stadium. Like this is a growing area. It's popular, all that. And they're like, oh, and your rents are too high. Like we want you to drop your rents from 980 to 600. Ooh. And oh, I'm like, man. I was just at 100% occupancy at 980. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no. And you want me to pay you a fee? No. So I leased them all and got it back to 100% occupancy in 45 days. And I was like, now that I showed you I can do it, you're fired. So <laughs> that's the if I have to step in, you're getting fired yeah. already. So did you, so that's actually why she started managing our properties because all those years we were yeah. going just what you what you just described is why we fired. If that individual is listening, this is why you got fired. <laughs> and Misty hired herself was that reason because it was always something or kickbacks. That was when we experienced was the yeah. you know they send in the company and the company says you need all new electrical and you send another electrician out there and like, it's 300 bucks. Was it 300 bucks? <laughs> and he fixed whatever it was, you know? It's, yeah, I get it. This is, so did you, so do you manage your own stuff now or do you, yeah. you do? You have to. You just... um, and so, you know, now I'm targeting mostly commercial and I find that to be the easiest, mm -hmm. but really hard to get loans, really hard to sell very easy to get the same value add as apartments yeah um but everything is extremely hard till you have at least and then once you have at least you're good for three to five years you almost don't have to do anything yeah at that point you can just it's mailbox money so to, to me it would be the best asset if it wasn't so hard to lease out and so hard to sell yeah so yeah. if it weren't for that i would only own commercial but it'll like, sit a lot longer yeah but I, I want to be safe, so I diversify. Yeah, we're going through that right now. We, we're leasing a one of our commercial spaces out, and it's just it's been what four, three months, three, three, three four, four months. months. Man, just hurry up and lease, please. Somebody, yeah. <laughs> somebody, just raise your hand and take this. <laughs> um, so I, I've got a question for you. So you know, because you went from plumbing, you said you went to Vegas, things didn't blow up, and then you kind of went full time. You know, I, I'm sure people think this, and and uh, I think it'd be interesting to kind of ask, like day-to-day -day life for you like what does that look like after you went full-time and just now you know what is that you know kind of like walk us through that like you, you wake up in the morning you know are you kind of looking through deals or is every day different i mean what does that day-to-day -day look for you um depends on how much i have going on um if it's a busy time we're doing a lot of rehabs and if they're local i wake up go through my emails for about an hour mm -hmm. um shopping deals replying to title companies and then <coughs> and then I will be driving around checking on job sites 
just because I do most of it virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes down to the details, um, I like to at least walk the job like every couple of days. But like right now we have a renovation going on course gain. It's an hour and a half away. I'm not going there near as much. So they're sending me pictures. Yeah. Um, but every once in a while you got to go out there cause tri- pictures can be tricky <laughs> or they could be like, Oh, I thought you wanted the toilet in the laundry room. You know, <laughs> but you just got to go check it out and make sure everything's going all right. Are you early riser? You one of those guys that get up early or you just kind of, I mean, like I have to, yeah, I have to cause it doesn't matter if I'm sick, if I feel good, if I'm in Vegas, if I'm in Dallas, whatever, 7 a.m., my phone's getting blown up by contractors. Mm-hmm. So I have to be. Yeah. I ask that because, you know, some people listen to this and they'd be like, hey, they want to make that shift. And, and a lot of people we've talked to just on the podcast, you know, they've made the shift like yourself, whether it was IT or plumbing, you know, like if, and they've, you know, obviously things like getting up early and all that and that day to day, like what you'd go through. You know, we haven't talked about that with anybody. And there's a lot of those things that you go through. You know, you wake up and check in emails and, yeah. you know, it's not, you wouldn't, so would you, it's not a super sexy, right? It's not like yeah. a sexy thing you're doing all day long. They think you're driving around, you know, it's really, there's a lot of mundane tasks, would yeah. you say? I mean, you just over and over. I work seven days a week, but it's not, it's not terrible. Yeah. Like yeah. I can choose my hours. I can choose what I do. Um, You know, I'm going to Fort Worth today because I've got a lot of, commercial properties in Fort Worth. Mm-hmm. I like to put my eyes on them once a month. So I go out there the same day as a real estate meetup and I get a hotel while I'm out there and I just make like a thing out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you this deals. Let's talk about that. So what is one of the most challenging deals you've, you've had to do? Maybe it was a, you know, from the hardest deal, the one that just sticks in your head. Um, I'd say the hardest one was the apartments because I, I had to get all my growth from there. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn to build my own team for renovating. And during the two years that I turned over that property, we probably bought rehabbed and either rented or sold maybe about a hundred single family houses during that time. Mm -hmm. So I really learned how to scale through that. I learned that apartments are nothing like houses. You know, the city's way much more involved throughout Mm -hmm. the entire process. A lot of roles are different. Um, the lending was different. That was the first property that I actually took debt on. Um, cause I remodeled it when I got to the end, I was like, okay, like I, you know, I ran out of money probably twice on the apartments, but you know, I wasn't broke. I had like probably 60 houses. So yeah. I was like, Hey, I'm running low on money. I'm going to sell this house. Hey, I'm running low, sell this house, finish the apartments, leasing it out. I'm making you know, 30,000 a month <clears throat> cash flow. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take some debt, refi it at 50%, get my money back. And, you know, not only did I get to replace those two houses, but I got to buy, you know, another 30 properties after that. So you think one of the biggest things for you is help is scaling is, because we talked about that too, you, before we started, um, you know, Misty and I've never sold anything over these, all these years. And of course, it's a lot slower in that aspect. But you, you'll sell. Yeah, you know, you'll you'll actually kind of sell things. And... I have no attachment to any of my properties. <laughs> yeah, like I don't care how much I love it. If I can't get it at the price I want, I don't want it. And if I do own it, I like the second that I feel like I could be doing something easier, closer, better asset, something at least better, whatever. You know, I have no problem selling it. So I buy and sell all the time. Time to let go, Misty. <laughs> it's time to let go. <laughs> so what about um what about one of your, you know, most memorable deals? What would you say is something like maybe not challenging, but it just that was awesome. Um, always will be my first rental property. Um that that I take a lot of pride in. Um my first flip that I was telling you about that I did whenever I sold it, um, I was telling you before the show started. Mm-hmm. The guy to buy it gave me a shoebox with fifty thousand dollars collateral to hold it, and I remember like I just stared at the box and I went home and I cried. And for everybody that's like, "Oh, I thought you were a lot cooler than this," no, seriously, like <laughs> I went home and I held the box and I like bawled my eyes, yeah. not like a tear, like I bawled my eyes crying. And it's because like before that, I don't think I'd ever seen more than a thousand dollars, you know, and um. Like I said, we 
we grew up extremely not wealthy. Um, so that was life changing to me. That was huge. Crazy. And then you mentioned too something that they wanted to, they wanted to give it or sell it back to you. Yeah. They just, they, the guy that bought it, he just reached out to me about two months ago. I was asking if I'll buy it back. So <laughs> that's crazy. Is that, did you consider it? I did consider it, but like I told you, like I'm heartless with real estate. Like I don't have attachments. <laughs> yeah. And so if I'm not buying it at 70%, I don't want it. That's probably one of the things though, that makes it, makes you even more successful than a lot of others is that you're, you are heartless with it. You're, it's, and it's not heartless. Like you don't have a heart. You're just, you're, you're not attached. You're yeah. Like it's just meant to, it's a vehicle. And yeah. so for you, you know, you're, Business. Yeah, you use your heart. It's not heartless. You use your heart less. That's yeah. all. You know, like maybe that one house is the only one that you get close to, right? Just uh, that one. But yeah, but I also, yeah. I don't look at it as buying and selling real estate. I look at it as trading. So kind mm -hmm. of like with stocks, they call it day trading, even though you're buying and selling. So I think of it the same way or like Pokemon cards, really. <laughs> and I tell people that want to get in real estate, I'm like, remember when you sold Pokemon cards? Remember when you sold iPhones? Same thing, just bigger. And so like, I really, if I do sell a property, it's because I'm like, okay, I could take this 900 square foot house that needs probably, you know, it's a great shape. You could rent it on any day of the week, but the next five years, it's going to need 30 grand into it because the roof's pretty old, sewer's pretty old, you know, foundation's starting to move a little bit. Mm -hmm. I could sell it right now. I could make $80,000 profit and I could go buy two houses that are a better asset class. And so, you know, I've got no problem trading stuff. And so whenever I sold my two apartment complexes that I had, um, I took where I was making a combined $30,000 cash flow, but doing a lot of work and a lot of headache and a lot of leasing and people doing one year leases and moving out after three months and all that. Yeah. And I was able to buy a lot of commercial properties where I had millions and extra equity on top of that by buying good deals could make maybe a little bit less cash flow, but no work. Like I had to bust my butt to lease it and then forget about it. Mm -hmm. Something, something I want to ask you to talk about equity deals and just different stuff. So I know in the, you, in your real estate group, I see some people come in there with some wild, some wholesalers come in there with some wild numbers, right? They come in, they like throw down, we got a wholesale deal and I know Misty are like, I would never touch that. Like, yeah. what have you seen kind of, you know, that things have changed obviously since when you started and, um, and now, you know, what's, what's changed for you, your business, all that. I mean, you know, from the beginning to now, as um, far as the way the market and stuff and what you see. I used to mainly source my own deals, but with scale, can't keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to get a lot of stuff from wholesalers. That's getting hard because they're out of control. Right. I saw an email <coughs> <coughs> on the way here. Um, I saw an email. It's a house in Mesquite. They want 200000 for it. I know Mesquite, like back in my end, I was born there. Right now, on MLS, if that house was like top, top, top condition, it would be worth two hundred to two twenty. Mm -hmm. They wanted one ninety eight for it. And it said needs foundation, needs an AC, needs all cosmetics. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, like I could buy something off MLS right now that's nicer. And if I put the money into it, like I'd be in at 120 percent. And I'm just like, y'all are on YouTube, like listening to the wrong guys. Or something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Some suckers gonna. So they're waiting for that one sucker that's gonna buy it. That's, yeah. And, and they unfortunately, do. they always find them because yeah. I meet a lot of people that have lost money that way. One thing I do like too, like, and that's, you know, I know within your group, you call them out. I, I love that. Like Misty has laughed at a few of them. She's like, Hey, you got to read this. You'll call them out and say, Hey man, you, you know, you guys need to get your stuff together. Well, it's you a, know, it's a team it's, sport. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. And a lot of people are like, all they care about is themselves. Like I got to make this 50 grand. I got to, okay. I can get that mindset. Maybe like if you're broke and you just need that one come up. But, you know, there's people have been doing this for like a year and still just out there like doing everything. I'm like, look, we have to work together. Like I, I've seen it. It has to work together. If not, if it falls apart. But when you're out here snaking people, you know, it's about the whole thing. Like you can only skin a cat once. 
Right. And if you do that, that person's out of real estate forever. They're never going to come back. They got a bad taste of it. And like, that's somebody they could have constantly made $10,000 a month off of, but instead they wanted to make 20,000 a month. Yeah. And I try to tell these people like, Hey, stop being greedy. Just give. And when you give in return, you're going to get back. Yeah. You get tenfold because of that. Cause you helped. No, that, that makes sense. It's, it's crazy to see some of those deals that, that are, that come across the table. I just, we haven't, I know we've never messed with wholesalers, especially once we started, we were kind of like you, same thing. Education didn't come till later. And then by the time we showed up, the real wholesalers were already kind of wild anyways. So yeah. like, it's not even worth the, worth mm-hmm. the time, you know? Um, but like, just like you, we were building our own martial arts business at the time and then eventually switched over. So we switched over a lot later than, than you did. We didn't start switching over till we actually didn't switch full time till 2020. So that was when the, we were just all in. So um, I wish I would have switched over in 2013 <laughs> <laughs> like you did. <laughs> I wish I would have known in 2013 that it was a good time to be buying everything. I would have bought it all. Like yeah. I'm driving past houses were 250000 I'm like, I could have got that for 30000 but I didn't because I didn't like where the door was or something. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like that skews your view? Like I know sometimes I, we, we drive by certain houses that we've seen. I'm like, I can't pay for that can't pay for that like do you feel like that skews no. it all sometimes just knowing what you knew what it used to be no no um because like i said i don't fall in love with stuff so i also don't fall in love to what stuff used to be worth um i have family they're like why would you pay this when you were getting them for this i'm like well times change it doesn't matter what used to happen mm-hmm. all that matters is today you know i used to be homeless at one point now i'm a millionaire like things change yeah. and you have to know things for what they are and you have to take everything at face value and, you know, same thing when prices drop. I'm not going to be like, oh, well, I should buy it for this because it used to be worth that. I'm like, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. That's definitely but good advice. I definitely have a commercial building that I 100% will not drive past because I could have bought it for an amazing deal and I didn't. <laughs> and uh, now. The one that got away. Yeah, now <laughs> it's worth so much money. Like, I won't even drive that direction anymore. It, like. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> don't exit. Long way don't around. Exit. You're, you're telling your family, don't exit. Get, don't don't do it. Don't yeah. turn that way. Stop it. <laughs> Grabbing the wheel. So craziest. Uh, what about one of your craziest real estate stories or investing stories? Like anything that just like sticks out where you're like, man, that was wild. Um, <clears throat> TV show worthy stuff. So I bought a house for like forty five thousand in Mesquite. Now it'd be worth. 220 something like that um house had so much trash in it i didn't know there was furniture in the house (laughs) and like we knew like um you couldn't get through the front door because it swung inward um so you had to go through the back door um, because it swung out and there was like beer not beer it was wine bottles like the one gallon jugs (laughs) and i mean all the way up to the countertop height in the kitchen and it was real dangerous because, one, they rolled, but, two, if you fell on them, like, they could break and kill you or whatever. <laughs> so um, I pay this company to come get stuff out. And they're like, hey, you know, there's furniture under all this? I'm like, no, nah, I didn't. But I guess that's easier for y'all. And uh, I just popped in while they're cleaning it out, and I saw boxes and boxes and boxes of comic books in one room. Mm. And uh, I was like, hey, don't throw those away. <laughs> and I even dug through their trash. They'd thrown some away. and. Some were ruined. Some of it was good, but I had it appraised and they were worth like $40,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I guess it was somebody that used to own a comic book store and they took the best stuff home and ended up passing away. And uh, so mm. that was pretty good. So you got the best stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then I bought a commercial building on Highway 30, 5,200 square feet. And when I bought it, the guy was like, tell me he was going to clean it out. And then one day he was like, oh, I guess you get to clean it out. And I'm like, well, you're going to leave me with everything? He's like, yeah, I am moving it. <laughs> and I'm like really upset about this. And I start going through it. I'm like, well, there's two forklifts here. There's a shipping container oh, I can wow. sell for three grand. <laughs> and I start going through it. And like there was all these boxes. I'm like, what are in these boxes? I open it up. And it's like a whole room of like autographed Star Trek <sighs> stuff. Oh, dude. And, uh, <laughs> Then there was like two pinball machines behind all that. And I ended up selling all that stuff for, I don't know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. I sold it all separately, um, which is great that that happened because that's right when COVID hit. 
and prices skyrocketed. And so <laughs> I got to go a hundred thousand dollars over budget on my rehab. Um, <laughs> storage so, wars is what it sounds like. <laughs> Little storage wars. Yeah. Like all uh, everybody always asks me, they're like, Where do you get all this stuff? I'm like, every house that I buy that's abandoned, like it's always a squatter or not a squatter, I guess. A hoarder. Yeah. And uh, they got good stuff. <laughs> I, I, do you think they forget about it? Like, yeah. Do you think they actually go, I for, you know, like the guy's like, I'm not cleaning it out, but does he actually forget that he has Star Trek? Most signed? of the time, the people have passed away. And most of the time, they pass away with it because they won't get rid of anything. And then most of the time, their family has dealt with the hoarding for so long that they despise all the stuff. Mm hmm. The houses, the memorabilia, everything. And I'm sure they've probably gone through some kind of like heartache and stuff through it. But most of the time they're like, I don't want to know what it is. I don't want it. I want it gone. That makes sense. So I got asked in the comic book. I, I grew up with comic <laughs> books. Did you, did you end up selling those too? Or? I did. Yeah. I literally just sold them probably because that was probably about two, three years ago that I got them. Um, I just sold them maybe about two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Make it hefty. It was just fun. Yeah, I did pretty good. I've got a uh a friend, his uh dad does where he goes to like different shows and trades things like hot wool cars and all that. And I tried selling them off individually and people were like, Hey, can you drive an hour and meet me to buy this one comic book? And I maybe <laughs> and I'm like, No. So I told him I was like, Here, you sell it all, whatever you get, give me half of it. And I made thousands. I did good. It's awesome. So you've so a lot of the stuff for you has been, or, or like some of the crazy stuff has been from hoarders. Yeah. It's just people who left stuff behind or died with it. Yeah. That's nice. What about any, um, I got to ask, because these are, all, everybody has these at some level, repair horror stories. Those are always fun. Um, Definitely on the I-30 building. Like I said, COVID just hit. And that was the biggest rehab I'd ever done. Um. I could remodel any house. Like I had, a, I built a great team. We could rehab any house and do anything, new AC, new electric, anything for 30 to 50,000, like mm -hmm. 50 being the worst case scenario. And so I was like, all right, on this commercial building, it's huge, but it still has the same amount of like electrical and all that. It's just only more flooring and sheetrock, $80,000 budget. Well, it's the biggest fence I'd ever done in my career. Um, I think it was like 900 linear feet. And then like, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of COVID where like all lumber just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm driving to like different States nearby oh, wow. just to try to finish this fence because like time's money. Like, yeah, I could shut down real estate for two years and wait till COVID's over. But like, that's not how the money is. Like I just need to finish it. And every fence supplier is like, can't get it. Can't get it. It's going to be eight months till I can get it. I'm like, mm. there's no way. So I'm like going to this Lowe's in Greenville. I'm getting 30 pickets. I'm going to this one in <laughs> yeah. Oklahoma and I'm getting 200 and you know, uh, I'm paying four times the price, but I was like, I don't care. I just got to get it done. And then like I was pulling permits and I couldn't get my permits approved because nobody was going to work because of COVID. And I was like, look guys, it's been six months. Like I get it but you need to approve my permits or I'm just going to do the building and you can find me if you want, <laughs> but I'm going to do it and I'll just take pictures of the entire process and you can sue me. And, yes. uh, they still want to prove them. And then I went to Facebook and tagged the mayor and made pretty, uh, blasting post. And that got, <laughs> that got it. That got the job moving real quick, <laughs> especially when it was one month before reelections. <laughs> Y'all better get, get on that. Yeah. Guys, hurry up. <laughs> what about apartments? Any any crazy tenant apartments? Any any crazy tenant stories with the apartment complexes? I do. I don't know if we could talk about it. Nah. Um, but it could be all right. I, they, I, I, I had a pimp prostitute problem <laughs> when I first bought <laughs> when I first bought the apartments by the Cowboy Stadium. I I one hundred percent believe that our our uh, the Jiu Jitsu Academy we were at was over there when I'm growing up. And that was before the stadium came in and yeah. it cleaned it all out and it was still a cesspool. Yeah. So <laughs> mine, I, mine were over there off 180 in Grand Prairie, but right there at 360 yeah. and 180. So pretty rough area. Um, 
whenever I sold it, it was coming up, but it still wasn't like a great area. But um, how'd you handle that one? <laughs> uh, I had a buddy that's an investor who worked for the Grand Prairie Police Department. So he's kind of helped me clean it up a little bit because like mm. everybody that lived there was a drug addict, a drug dealer, a prostitute, or the prostitute's customer. That's a busy apartment yeah. complex, yeah. man. <laughs> and, that's a lot of in and out. <laughs> and, and, you know, I probably should have just kicked them all out on day one, but I was like, I'm going to cash flow on this building while I fix up the other one. And, like, it just kept getting worse and, like, more drug addicts coming and hanging out there. And uh, I kept, like, telling the prostitute, like, hey, you can't come here. The police trespassed her. They arrested her. She still kept coming. And uh, one day I seen her pimp dropping her off there. And I was like, hey, like, if you bring her here anymore, it's going to be a problem. And uh, he, like, shanked me in the neck with his keys. Oh, man. And um, I got in a fight with him, which I won. And then she jumped on my back. And I know this sounds terrible. But, <laughs> no, that's, that's funny, but, man. That's, 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 but I, I kind of had to throw her a little bit. Uh, <laughs> That's called self defense. Hey, look, man, I just know from the way we grew up. I'm like, you, yeah. I'll, I'll, man or woman, it's self defense. The police showed up. They arrested them both, and uh, I never saw them again after that. And um, I, I ended up fighting a crackhead there that wouldn't stop coming and shooting up and leaving his mm. syringes. Like, and like, it's not like I was like, oh, that's how I'm gonna go yeah. solve the problem. Like, I'm over there. I'm like, hey, dude, like whatever you got to do, like, can you do it somewhere else? And then they don't like, well, I've been coming here for 20 years. I don't care if this where you've been shooting up for 20 years. Like you got, you got to go somewhere else. And then they want to get froggy about it. And, yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So while you were fixing up that other building, were any of your materials or anything being taken? Okay. Or? Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so we had no problems at, well, I, that's a lie. So <laughs> the day I buy them, they have working AC. Um, the day that I go out to look at them after I close, the condensers were gone. Oh, God. And I'm like, I know these were here. Like, <laughs> like I wouldn't notice if they weren't here. I'm in <laughs> construction. So I go back through my pictures because I always take pictures while walking them. They're there. And I'm like, probably the owner that took them. Like, I don't know. That just seems like a weird coincidence. So I had that problem. Um, I slapped in AC units, which probably worked better than the crappy condensers they had. Um, cause like I said, I tried to get a building temporarily going mm -hmm. while remodeling the other one. Re re rewired. <coughs> we rewired an entire building. Um, and then one day somebody calls me and they're like, Hey, I think somebody broke in your building. I'm like, well, you think, or, you know, like, I don't understand. Like, what makes you think that? And he's like, well, there's a door open to one of your buildings and there's a guy sleeping in a car passed out. And it's like a hatchback where you can see in the trunk. He's like, the trunk's full of wire. Oh, and I'm like, the guy's passed out. And they're like, yeah. So I pull up there and I walk inside. And I'm like, yeah, this guy definitely cut wire. And so I call the cops, the cops pull up, they're knocking on the window. The guy's like out cold, but he like decided to break in maybe to do drugs. And he's like, Hey, while well, I'm in here, I stole some wire. And then he fell asleep. Um, <laughs> so he went to jail. They gave me restitution, which I never saw a penny of. But oh, he'll never see anything of that. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the first time that they at least offered me restitution. <laughs> but they were like, yeah, he's going to get probation. And if he doesn't make his payments, he goes back to jail. I never saw any of that. But so, so basically, he took a nap to get ready for the next leg. <laughs> I guess. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm tired, man. I got to take a moment. But it was I'll funny because the cops showed up. And we were all like making fun of the guy for like 30 minutes before he woke up. <laughs> Just watching him, looking at him. All that wire cutting. Yeah. Put him to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I just go take a nap. I'll be all right. I can redo this. I'm going to break into a bank. I'm going to rob him, take a nap, and I'm going to leave. And then keep it going. Dude. <laughs> so let me ask you um, kind of like strategy stuff. So talk strategy a little bit. So I know you said you didn't start doing debt till later. What about now? Like, do you look back or you, or not, not look back? Do you use debt more now than before? Do you, or you try to pay like cash for a lot of things or like, what do you, do you have a mix or pref do you prefer doing a certain way? I'm way more balanced on it than I think most people. Mm -hmm. So one during COVID, I sold a lot of my 
um, hood properties. And I bought them for like 40,000 a piece. I'm selling them for 200,000 a piece. I was selling them 1031 ing them, but I'd sell three houses that had debt mm-hmm. and I would 1031 into one commercial property and buy it debt free. Gotcha. Um, so a lot, I would say 90% of my portfolio is debt free. When I do take on debt, it's to buy something that's a great deal that I don't have the money on hand for. And I typically do not go past 50% leverage on multifamily or commercial. If it's a three bedroom house, I'll go 70%. Mm. But like, I know people are doing like 85 on everything. And I'm like, yeah. like, I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. That scares me. I, I have no interest because if, if things change or, you yeah. know, if, if, I mean, even now if stuff drops from what's going on, those people are, can be in yeah. trouble. And like I said, I do everything different than everybody else. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm liquid more than seven figures. Um, I have, uh, all my commercial properties are debt free with the exception of two. Um, they're in 30 year fixed low interest rate debt, mm. which was really hard to find on commercial. I didn't even know it existed. Um, most of my houses, it's like 50, 50 if they have debt, but if they do, they're at 65, 70%. Yeah. So did you get, you mentioned, we were talking scale a minute ago too. Like you mentioned that you don't look for the deals yourself anymore as much. You have, somebody that kind of does that for you. You eventually kind of handed that off. That's really the only part that I do. Oh, that's my part. Um, so I used to go like door knocking and stuff and source every deal myself. Now, like it's through mostly wholesalers or word of mouth. People are like, Hey, you know, somebody told me that you buy commercial properties, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been doing some land, um, which I've been sourcing myself. Um, and doing land deals is kind of new to me, but a lot of money in it. Yeah. If I could figure out how to cash flow land, it would be the best asset. But. <laughs> yeah. That was, when we talked to Amir, he was talking about that with him, and his dad and how they did, how they used land. And I was just kind of like, man, I never really thought about it like that. So really. I, I live on a ranch yeah. and I got it for free. Um, how I did that is I use an app called land glide. Um, it's just kind of like CAD. It shows you different parcels, tells you who owns it, their contact info. And, um, I just went over any land that was over 20 acre spots and found this guy who had a hundred acres. And I was like, well, you sell it. And he said, yeah, I'll take 3000 an acre at the time. It was worth 15. Mm -hmm. Um, so I bought it. I sold 40 acres of the hundred for, uh, I believe 20,000 an acre. And so not only did that give me my part of the land for free, it paid for my house, my shop, all the infrastructure and everything. That makes sense. So you bought it, downsized a little bit and used the cash to, yeah. and then you're done. So now it's, everything's paid for. Yeah. So now I've got a, I live on a $2 million ranch that I got for free. That's crazy. Did you have to, on that was, did you, did you build the house and everything on there too? Mm-hmm. So you built it and you had to go and, run plumbing and all that as well yeah. and the whole nine yeah, yards. Yeah, and the land that I sold paid for all of that. Yeah. And then in addition to that, I can do an ag exemption for wildlife um, so I don't have to have animals. Um, and that makes it where my property tax is only $2,000 a year. And then I also got an ag card for, like, um, sales tax. Mm-hmm. So a lot of stuff that I buy at, like, um, feed stores and things like that are all tax free as well. So, yeah. Misty, we're getting a ranch. <laughs> <laughs> We've always talked about it. Storyland. There it is, right there. Storyland. <laughs> we got we got to get a ranch, man. Is, he just explained exactly how you get a ranch. We just go a little further south of Burleson, because we're 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 out of South Fort Worth. <laughs> so, a little south of Burleson and just find ourselves a nice little spot. I'll do the I'll do the deal <laughs> finding. So. How's Craigslist looking these days? <laughs> Um, I've poked my head in there once or twice and it's looking like my space. You're going to find the prostitute and the pimp in there. But I will tell you, nah, they took, they took the, the prostitutes off of Craigslist. <laughs> uh, I think that's what killed it. Um, they, they, so, they, so they showed up at your apartments. Like, well, we can't go to Craigslist anymore. But I, I, I got to give it up to Craigslist. My plumbing company was built off of that where I got all my starting business. I made my mer- first million dollars through my plumbing company that way. Um, I definitely made my first million dollars in real estate that way. 
I love Craigslist. Um, I hope it makes a comeback somehow, but it, it ain't should, happening today. You should buy it. Buy Craigslist. <laughs> yeah, I wish yeah, I could. Man, just buy Craigslist and just put someone in place to run it. Do you still have the plumbing company? Yeah. You do? Yeah. But you have someone else that runs it pretty much yeah. still it's, to Is this it day. Is the same person? Uh, no, I've been through a, a few people, okay. but it's business. Yeah. So let me ask you this. How do you, how do you manage that? Because I know like, you know, Misty and I, we have a couple of different between martial arts and real estate or whatever you know you i feel like i get pulled different directions sometimes where i'm like oh, man i gotta go hold on misty i gotta go do this and it's like okay now i'm back to here like how do you manage that when you put somebody in place and be able to do both of those things i don't um move on to anything else so i've automated and simplified as much as possible mm -hmm. um some people like make too many roles or well it should be done this way and i'm like well i know it should be done that way but if the tenth person we hired still isn't doing it, then there's something wrong with our rules. Not, you know, it doesn't matter how it should be done. If people aren't doing it, it's not right. Um, on top of that, like there's a couple of times where I'll, you know, just pop in to my, on my phone to look at the books, and I'm like, receivables are down. Let me focus on this for thirty days and get mm -hmm. it back in order. Um, so do you have to? You kind of try to meet with them. Do you meet like once a week with the 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 team or the plumbing? Team? No, all the management just... does meet every Tuesday. Yeah. Um or every Wednesday. Um <coughs> Um I do not, but they call me probably twice every day. Um like they were just telling me that one of our brand, brand new plumbing vans somebody attempted to break into it. And uh, it's great because back in the day, they would break into it and we lose probably $30,000 worth of equipment. This time, they did $5,000 worth of damage to the van but couldn't get in. And uh, I was like, hey, make an insurance claim on it and move on. So. It, it's the pimp. <laughs> He's back. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you don't, do you feel that tug and pull though sometimes on the business where maybe you're, like you mentioned, have, like do you feel that at all or? I used or to, used to, but, um, I'm always working on the processes. Like, I'm not like, this is the way we've done it since 1938. My granddaddy, <laughs> no, that's not like, I'm always like, how can I make things easier, faster and more streamlined? And, um, I try to make things where people cannot break the rules. Um, so very much rely on CRMs for that. Um, I use Buildium for like our rental properties. Mm -hmm. Um, we use Service Titan, which is way overpriced for the plumbing company, <laughs> but solved a lot of problems that cost a lot more than the overpriced CRM. So it's worth it. So you've hired somebody not only in the plumbing, but in your plumbing business, but you've also hired your own in-house property management, property manager or management yeah. as well. And then systems and processes on both of them. Yeah. And that's it. Checks and balances. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I definitely learned that word um, when somebody that worked for my plumbing company stole a lot of money from oh. me. Mm. And I was like, how could this happen? And they were like, check some ounces because <laughs> the problem is the person that was checking it is the person that's ripping you off. Yeah, and they were so, balancing it too. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm not a genius in any way. I just made way more mistakes a lot faster than other people. Yeah. And so I learned from them, made sure not to repeat them. And uh, the systems and processes is what really helps you yeah. scale that and be able to not feel that, that pull and tug. Yeah. So, I know I feel that sometimes. I still feel that. I, I, I look forward to getting to where you're at one day where I don't feel that pull and tug of, you know, come back, come back. Cause that's, it's, it always seems like, how long did you go through that process? That process? How long would you feel like you felt? Did it take you to go from build systems processes, putting those things together and then going, okay, now I've got to, now I can back off. It was crippling it. painful for the first year um, because, like, they were always wanting something at the plumbing company. And I'm like, but I'm trying to do this. Like, y'all are hurting me. I'm trying to do real estate. And I realized I was like, that's my fault. Um, <clears throat> and then I had somebody try to buy, buy my plumbing company from California. And a business broker came in. He was like, you know, this isn't really a sellable company because you built it around yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't build it to where somebody else could come in here 
and just take over. And I learned from that. I was like, okay, so instead of all emails going to mine and then me sending it to whoever, like everybody's got their own emails and, you know, I came up with a lot of processes and stuff. And then I was like, okay, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I'm going to do real estate. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm going to check in on y'all. But I'm not running the business. That's your job. But I'm going to check in on y'all and, you know, see what you need and try to tackle that the best I could. And then it would be like, okay, you're going to run the property management. You're going to run the plumbing company. And then I'm managing y'all. Everybody comes to y'all. Nobody's allowed to talk to me but y'all too. And then, you know, it let me focus on the things that I needed to focus on. So it's building that management chain. Everybody's good at built working on the employees, but not the management chain. And that's what allowed you to separate yourself yeah. and not feel that kind of pain. That's man. That's, 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 it's, I still have problems. Like yeah. I said, you know, one day I was like, Hey, the account for the plumbing company is always a hundred thousand. Now it's 20. Like what's going on? I mm-hmm. uh, found out that the person that we had hired had not been staying at work. Like they were like, Oh, I'm going to go do this. And instead they were going home and $200,000 worth of invoices didn't get billed out. Mm. You know? And so I fired that person um, because I believe in making mistakes, but if you were doing stuff on purpose, I, mm. no, you're gone. Um, and so I brought somebody else in. I diversified stuff more where checks and balances could catch that kind of stuff as well. And I, I focused, I'd stay in a hotel for a month right next door to the office of my plumbing company because I live an hour away from the office. And I stayed in that hotel for a month, went there. I was there first thing before anybody else, and I left last for 30 days. Retrained everybody, got everything cleaned up, and I left. So I got to ask this because I know this is something we've gone through ourselves, and I'm, I'm sure, sure you can relate to it. When you are trying to make that shift and that switch, did you feel the pain as far as like the plumbing company, you know, the finance is going down some and then having to come back, bring it back and then go down and then, you know, how did, how did you manage that? Or did, did you yeah, go through that at all? When, yeah, when it went down some, but not enough to freak out because like, look, nobody's ever going to run it as good as you. Right. So the question is, are you going to run it profitable and are you going to like keep the cost down? And, you know, once a quarter I'll check in on everything and like, are you profitable? Or are you keeping costs down? Um, but I'm not going to be like, look, I used to make a hundred thousand and you're making 50. Like mm-hmm. you can't do that because they're not going to run the same. They don't know what, you know, it's not their business. Like they don't get the reward that you get. Yeah. And so all you have to look at is look, I'm getting a free 50,000 it might be half, but I'm getting it free because I'm no longer involved. And so you have to think of like, how much was I worth being there? And be, is that an acceptable loss? Right. Is it worth the extra 50 for you to be there all the time yeah. versus and not I'm be sh- there. I'm sure you're making more than 50 being on the real estate side. Yeah. Spending you've made your time there. And then so that you've, you've taken the same process and thought process and then made even more and applied that same. So basically you've, you've even, you've applied it to your real estate, the same thing, yeah. the, the systems process. And then I went from getting a shoebox with 50,000 where I'm crying over it. So now I just did a deal where I made a million dollars and like all my friends are like, eh. I'm like, y'all don't want to go celebrate. And they're like, you do it all the time. And I'm like, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. <laughs> like I want to reward myself. Like, I-, I wanted to go. Are you guys sure you don't at least want to go to dinner or something? <laughs> that's, that's, that's awesome. But I, you know, I asked that cause it's, it's, it's something I think that, um, you know, with, with I guess being entrepreneurial and, you know, just kind of how people are like, we always want something, you know, you always want, or you always want to go out and it, they, I can relate to what you're doing. You're like, Hey, I was started here. I want to move to here. And just knowing that, you know, that making that switch is hard because, you know, I know when we left, started leaving the school, it wasn't making what it was when I was there, but I'm the coach. I'm the, I'm the teacher, you know, so it's not there all the time. I'm not there all the time. So it's interesting to hear kind of where you're at and where you were and started with $50,000 shoebox. And then now with all those systems and processes, because I'm sure someone listening to this is going to go, man, I'd like to do that, you know, get out of their current situation and then yeah. move to real estate full time. So 
Um, and it's nice to hear that, you know, like you just, so you spend your time on just systems, processes, automations, and just keeping that in tight and then checking in and not letting anybody get to you. Basically, like you, 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 that's the management team. Yeah. You, 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 um, now I do tell them if your management is not doing what they're supposed to be doing and you think there's a concern, call me. That's only happened once. And it's, you know, if you think like management's just colluding to do some sketchy stuff, call me. Mm -hmm. So they definitely know who I am, but don't call me to ask me like if you can take tomorrow off. (laughs) You know, when people on Facebook are like, hey, can your plumbers come out tomorrow? I don't know. That's not what I do. Call the office. Yeah. Um, You have to talk to management. And not only to give respect to myself and what I'm doing, but to give respect to them. It's, you know, it's kind of like you can't be like, hey, my wife's the boss, and they ask her a question, you step in front of her, you're like, answer the question. Like, it's disrespectful <laughs> to her kind of thing. And it's same thing in the management. Like, I've had a lot of managers that are like, hey, this is the person underneath me, and then they completely, like, go around them for everything. And I'm like, well, what's this person's job then? It's it's because I guess they have to be in control of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, which I don't. I just have to see everything. I want oversight, not control. That makes that makes one hundred percent sense. I mean, I think that's valuable too, especially for anybody that that uh, is trying to get to that level and wants to scale. That does require a team. I like what you said. That it requires a team to do all of this. And like yeah. I was saying, um, with your business, it's kind of like a house. You can't be like, oh, the house used to be worth three hundred thousand. So now that it's a hundred thousand, I can just buy it blindly. It doesn't matter what it used to be worth. It doesn't matter what your company used to do when you were there because you're not there. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is, is it profitable and are they doing better or worse than, than what they were the day they took it over? Are they growing it or are they doing worse? So do you try, let me ask this because, you know, having the, the, both the businesses, obviously real estate's your, you know, that's your thing. Do you try to, I don't want to say, I say push, but like kind of like, hey grow guys, it. let's, let's grow it, you know, no. or you just let them no, do their thing or what are your, I was growing it very fast. Um, we were growing about when I was involved about 25% a year, which was really fast. Um, but it was hard to manage. And as the growth went up, As the gross went up, the net went down, and it's because we're hiring people that don't care. They weren't team players. Um, our office people were getting overworked, so they were, like, skipping steps that were causing issues, like something not getting invoiced out or um, over-ordering or anything that would cost money. And so I learned, like, we're better off with three people, three trucks running, than we were with eight. And it, it was just because I don't look at gross. I don't care about equity. I care about the cash flow. Like how profitable is the company? And with the plumbing company, I only pay myself a $500 a week salary. Um, and I didn't start doing that until about two years ago. Before that, I'd never, ever, ever taken a salary from it. So any money I ever wanted for like food or anything, I had to do a side hustle to get it. And that's because I don't believe in taking from my business and, and my real estate. I've still to this day never paid myself. Mm. So yeah. because I, I can't, I'm like addicted to the compounding interest of all the money. So I'm like, <laughs> all right, well, if I pay myself a hundred dollars to buy some shoes, that hundred dollars over eight years could have been, <laughs> and that's the way I look at stuff, which is a little psycho, but no, I respect that. I mean, we do, we, we don't take anything uh, Aside from property management fees of her own, because that's just what she does, we've never really. I mean, there's no dinners, nothing that comes out of it. It's just, just sits. I always, I always make myself do little side hustles to get my my fun money. Yeah. No, <laughs> man, I respect, I respect that. So you you feel like is there? That's that's another kind of leads to another question too. Like, do you feel like um, there comes a point where you know you can get too big? And it's just too expensive. And then instead, like there, there's, there's like a sweet spot of saying, you know what, if I just have this plumbing company this size, or if I, you know, that 
I can make just the right amount of money and I can stick to just that. So I'm not saying that's the number, but just I'll use a number. Like if you had a business and you said, if I made 30,000 a month on this business, you know, depends on how greedy you are. Yeah. So (laughs) I live a very, you know, everything I have is paid for. My home's paid for, my truck's paid for, um, my company pays for all my like cell phone and all that stuff. How much money do you really need? And so I know people that have like three single family houses and then they're like, I'm going to go buy a tower like the one we're in right now. And they go and they work all these like loan deals and stuff to buy it, go bankrupt because they got too greedy. Mm. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't go buy a tower. I'm just trying to say like stick to one step above what you're comfortable with. Mm. And like, how much do you really need? Because so many people I know are so focused on money, 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 that they forget family, they forget their spouses, they forget, you know, their kids, they forget to take care of even themselves. You know, hey, you used to play drums. Do you play drums anymore? Nothing. It's always about money. Well, what was the point of the money? Want it to like better all those other things that you're neglecting. And so I net more money than I can spend. And so I definitely play it a lot safer, a lot slower. I'm focusing on taking care of my widowed grandmother, um, spending a lot of time with my dad and my younger sisters, and I'm still growing, but I'm not going to forget what I did this for in the beginning. You don't lose yourself in the process. Yeah, of, and that's, I, I know that sounds like a stupid thing where, you know, you could put that on a shirt or whatever, but that's a huge issue that happens in real estate or any kind of wealth is a lot of people are like, Hey, I did this to take care of my mom. And then you start working so much, you stop talking to your mom yeah. and then you're ignoring her. And then you move three hours away and then all that. It's like, <laughs> and then you buy a Lambo and it's like, how did that benefit your mom? <laughs> so, <laughs> you drove up in the Lambo to say hi to mom <laughs> on Thanksgiving. That was it. Like I said, it's just about how greedy you are. And if you're greedy, there's that's yeah. fine. It's your life. Do it however you want. But like, at what point is it enough? And, like, I'm not going to stop growing because, obviously, inflation and taxes and stuff, i got to keep it going. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm definitely going to escalate my quality of life now just as much as my real estate because yeah. that got neglected for the past 38 years. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. That's good stuff. So last que- well, a few last questions I want to ask is and just, just kind of talk on a business level. So do you look at your plumbing company and say, we have to make this much to make things go. And if it doesn't, then, hey, management, you guys need to kick it in gear. Yeah. Is that kind of how you manage it yourself? You're like, hey, you look at the books and it says, okay, we didn't make, there's this number. Management knows they need to make this. And if they don't make it, we got a problem. Yeah. And that's pretty much, that's how they stay in line. Yeah. We have quarterly minimums. And, um, you know, I, I'm i very giving because, like I said, like, I I'm comfortable now. Right. So now I'm all about sharing the wealth. So now I like to give bonuses for no reason. Just like, hey, I got too much money. Here's a bonus, everybody. And if I can't do that, like, that's a whole team problem. Right. And I tell them, like, remember when we, everybody used to get bonuses just just because? Like, you brushed your teeth today. Here's $1,000. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, don't you miss those? Well, then everybody needs to sit down and figure out, like, what we're missing that used to do that. You're at that you're at that level where you're you're worried about taking care of other people. Yeah. And it's not yourself anymore. In the and beginning I'm telling of you, survival. I'm telling you, the yeah. more you take care of people, I've seen two there's only two kind of managers that I've seen. Mm-hmm. There's probably others, but there's the one that's always like, How can I cheapen everything by even a penny, including like my employees? And then the ones who run everything like, if I give this, I'll get this back. And I'm that kind of person. I've learned the more that I put into people, the more I get back in return. That makes sense. They buy into the process and make it their own. Yeah. yeah. You're investing into them. Just like you invest in a house or whatever. You're investing your resources and time into that person. Just like any any of my businesses, like if you do not feel like you belong here, that your family, if you do if you're like, Oh, I want to do this for three years and then I wanna, you know, start a band, like I don't want you here. Mm-hmm. I want the people that are like, This is where I wanna be, this is my life. They feel like they own the company where they're yelling at me, even though I'm the boss. They're like, we should do it like this because they're passionate. Right. Like, I like that. You want them to challenge you. 
Tell yeah. me I'm wrong, right? Yeah, I want <laughs> I want I want people that take a passion about it where they're like, okay, like I don't care. Yeah. You know, I don't want that. Yeah. No, that makes sense, man. That that is awesome, man. You know, it's I lo- I love that you went that direction with it and we talked about that because that's something that, you know, even though we're talking real estate, that's a huge part. And if someone's gonna scale all those that's that's advice that I mean people need to hear and that's such a huge part of it. So that that's man, that's solid. Can we circle back for a minute to uh, where you talked about building your team as far as like uh, remodeling and construction and stuff? Um, so I'm trying to remember, I, I know first off I made a post um, on Facebook and I was just like, if you know anybody that does anything in construction, like tag them. And I learned later, I'm going to give you a big tip. You want to know, because I do some virtual stuff too. Like I said, jobs are two hours away. Yeah. You want to know if a contractor is a good contractor, say, uh, send me a picture of your truck, your trailer, and your tools. <laughs> and if he sends you a Toyota Camry with a four foot ladder in the trunk, do not hire the guy. <laughs> but if the guy sends you like a nice truck that doesn't look like a crackhead owns it and a really nice trailer and the truck's full of tools and the trailer's full of tools, this guy most likely knows what he's doing. And I've learned that now. Like, just just get a picture of the truck and the tools. Because I've been in construction. And I know, like, all the best contractors have the best tools. Mm-hmm. And the crappiest ones are the ones that are, like, too cheap to buy anything. And I've literally hired a contractor who showed up in a Toyota, <laughs> Toyota Corolla. <laughs> I was going to ask. He had, he had a four-foot ladder and had, like, brand new in the box tool set from Walmart. And he even, like, unwrapped it in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just hiring him to get a dish off a roof. And I was like, how are you going to get on the roof? He's like, I'm going to hop on the fence from this ladder. And on the fence, I'm going to get on the first story's roof, then walk up the side, up the edge to the second floor. I'm like, no. That's horrible. No, no, no. no. So uh, I was going to ask that. I was like, he said Toyota Camry with a ladder in the back. Yeah. Something tells really me. Really specific. <laughs> I was like, something tells me this was a real story. <laughs> So I've learned. <coughs> That's funny. That works. So you just take a picture of the tools, the truck, and uh, yeah, yeah, and and and, 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 the and as long as the price works, you know, the nicer the truck and tools, he pays for it somehow. But um, I also learned, don't try to get the bottom price. Get the guy who's going to get it, the cheapest guy that's going to get it done right fast. That makes sense. Yeah. Because the bottom price is going to be the guy with the Camry, yeah, and the four foot. And it'll ladder. actually cost you more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you go back and fix it, you're like, yeah. I've hired many a uh, crackhead contractors, <laughs> and um, I'll tell you what, like they have their ups and downs. Like they will work night shift and stuff like that, but like it will always cost you in the end, even if they're cheaper, even if they're good at it. Um. The, they'll end up squatting in a place or something. I can give you a thousand. I, I just see Tyrone Biggums, Dave Chappelle. You know, I got that's pretty <laughs> close. I got, I got this. I got this ladder, man. <laughs> he gets dropped off by the pimp. <laughs> the pimp drops him off. So here you go. Well, man, um, man, that was just killer information. Uh, let me let me kind of ask this. You know, before we kind of wrap it up, is advice what would, what would you say the number one advice you'd give for somebody who's either getting started or you know they've been thinking about it and they were in your position many years ago and what kind of advice would you give somebody well there's no bigger way to fail than to not do it so a lot of people that sit in the corner sucking their thumb mm-hmm. um waiting for mama to come like do it for you it's not going to happen um i do not advise jumping in uneducated but just know the steps and then figure out the details later because you're never going to know it all. Like no matter how many books you read, the school hard knocks will always teach you more. (laughs) Um, But like I said, don't jump in uneducated, but like figure out what you, what you're doing and just do it. Like you have to, no matter what it is. Man, that is awesome. So um man great information i, I loved having you on uh I man i'd probably love to bring you back sometime too and it um, sounds like you, you got a lot of stories i'm sure you got even more <laughs> there's some more crazy stories so um uh, anyway if you want to share how people connect with you and if you have the facebook group 
You yeah, want to share that? Yeah, that's my preference. Um, hmm. It's Jawad Dashti, J-A-W-A-D. Last name is D-A-S-H-T-I. On everything other than Facebook, it's the Jawad Dashti. On TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, LinkedIn. And your Facebook group is? Um, if you're local to Dallas, I've got the DFW Real Estate Investment. Um, it's a pretty good group uh, to connect with other people. Um, if you're nationwide, um, I've got, um, well, I have a statewide group also. I don't even know the name of it. Texas something, real estate something. I don't use it near as much. I just got it in case I ever try to buy shopping centers in other major cities. Yeah. Um, but definitely reach out to me. Um, and I'd love to come back. So yeah, let me know. It was great, man. Great information. I think definitely, uh, I'm excited. I'm definitely excited. So, uh, thank you for coming on and, and, uh, that's it guys. We'll catch you guys next time.